like that. Few people outside of Amy's church, however, believed her story. The DA eventually dropped all charges for lack of evidence. But after nearly a year of press scrutiny and investigation, Amy's public image was devastated. I didn't talk. I just had faith it was all going to come out one way or other, and it did come out properly. Nobody proved otherwise. And uh, it was over. And mother continued. And life went on. But Amy's troubles were far from over. A once loyal group of temple officials made accusations of financial irregularities. Church monies funneled to Amy's personal accounts. She promoted several disastrous business enterprises that cost the church thousands of dollars in legal settlements. Amy feuded bitterly with her mother, and for years they didn't speak. Then an acrimonious conflict with her daughter erupted. Roberta had long been groomed to follow her mother to the pulpit, but now they clashed over control of church affairs. Increasingly, Amy cut herself off from the family and church members who had been closest to her. Tired and lonely, she longed for a retreat from her troubles. So she built a new home, a home far beyond her youthful dreams, a lavish villa at Lake Elsinore. She says, I'm with thousands of people in a service. And then she said, uh, I go home and uh, I'm alone. She was lonesome. And you can understand that. Uh, but I think she perhaps made a bad choice. Amy was married for a third time to David Hutton, a baritone from one of her sacred operas. And it's all over. We are back again. We've just been married 12 hours. But trouble surfaced almost immediately. Church members disapproved of Amy marrying while her second husband lived, a violation of Pentecostal church teachings of that era. Hutton's sketchy past was filled with other women, and he antagonized church officials by trying to assume a central role in temple business. Probably the greatest crisis that we ever had. We lost through that some of the very finest of our first generation leadership. She pro is probably the number one mistake that she ever made. And she asked her church to forgive her. But I'm sure that many people out there have their own particular troubles, only mine are always some unfortunate. They seem to get into the headlines. There were probably five, I think probably five newspapers in those days. So selling newspapers was a big thing. So I was crossing the street, and I heard this kid yell, Amy does it again. Amy does it again. And I thought, my land, what's this? I just come from the Bible college at noon. I hadn't heard a thing that she'd done, uh, you know, that was unusual. So I walked back to him. I said, uh, what'd she do? And he said, well, I don't know what she did, but it sells papers and just went on. Amy does it again. Her name wasn't even in the headlines. Oh, what are your plans for the future? Well, my plans, as the plans of all of us, should be uh, in the hands of the Lord to continue with my church work, to preach the gospel as long as I am able. Do you live in the castle of broken dreams? Gradually, the public wearied of the media circus. During the Depression, Amy's reputation recovered somewhat as she opened a church commissary that fed many thousands of destitute people. Four Square Church aid became more reliable than the city's strained welfare system and reached out to all races and creeds. Her civic contributions were honored by the mayor, police, and fire chiefs. But Amy never rekindled the public's once insatiable fascination with her. She had come to seem a relic from the gaudy decade of the 1920s. In 1944, Amy decided to travel to Oakland, California, 
making what was by then a rare public appearance to open a new four-square church. And going back to the hotel room that night, she was very happy. She said, son, I've never been happier being back on the evangelistic field. That's, that's where I most long to be. And uh, it was like a fulfillment, not realizing that at that morning she would pass away. Following her death at the age of 54 from an overdose of sleeping pills, ruled accidental, Amy's followers staged a funeral rivaling her greatest services. For days and days, they were backed up clear to Sunset Boulevard when she was lying in state in the temple. Thousands and thousands of people came by. People come by and just cry said, this is a lady that led me to the Lord. The public remembers her glamour and grandstanding, her scandals and her lonely fall from grace. But with enormous odds against her, Amy boldly reached for greatness and left an enduring legacy. Her church has survived and flourished. The congregation today numbers 1.2 million in 66 countries around the world. In Los Angeles, the members are a contemporary version of the 1920s migrants, Asian, Latino, Middle Eastern, African American, and many others. They think of Amy as a loving woman who, whatever her faults, left them precious gifts, warmth, community, a home they have long searched for. You can talk about me as much as you please. I'll talk about you down on my knees. Talk about me as much as you please. I'll talk about you. I ain't gonna grieve. I ain't gonna grieve, my Lord, anymore. My Next. Lord.